I was very tempted this morning to bring you a sermonette. But I had a pastor teach me many, many years ago that sermonettes are for Christianettes. And I don't think any of you are Christianettes. You know, Christianettes are like raisinettes and goobers. You know, I don't think we have any goobers here this morning. I pray that, that we don't. Our text this morning is from the first book of Corinthians, looking at chapter 15. If you have your Bible, you may open it with me and read along. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll be looking at verses 29, or reading 29 to 33, and I'll be honing in on verse 32. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 29 to 33. <clears throat> now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers. Just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. Let's speak to the author for just a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit which moved these men to pen your words to us. We ask now that you would reveal to us something we've never seen before. Teach us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The text I'm using is the 32nd verse. I mean, Paul says, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? And if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And what's that mean? What is Paul saying here? He's saying, if you're a Christian today, or you call yourself a Christian, and there's no resurrection, then we're wasting our time here now. We might as well be off waiting to play pool at the pool hall or go fishing or whatever you like to do. Watching the Yankees lose, which is not something I like to do, but I did yesterday two games that we've lost. Doing things that you want to do that are not part of sitting here. Why would we be here this morning if it wasn't for the resurrection? And that's Paul's argument, that's Paul's reason as he gives us this 30-second verses, God moves him to talk to you and I. We've all strolled through a cemetery, and we read the epitaphs, and we read the tombstones. I don't know about you, but I love reading tombstones. And sometimes I try to imagine what's going through somebody's dash. Remember what a dash is? That's that little line between the year they were born and the year they died. What were they doing? When I meet people for the first time, I love to find out where they're from, where they, you know, I, I love to find out how old they are because it gives a connection. You know, maybe we were doing some of the same things at the same time in same places. It gives us a way of connecting. And I, I try to imagine what people go through in their lives. We all go through different things. None of us share the same things. We never will see the same thing the same way we can. God's created us different, each and every one of us. He did not go around with a cookie cutter. And if you look at me, you're probably glad he didn't, because you don't want to be like me. We're different, and each and every one of us are. And the graves have been marked and kept through the years because what they contain, the bodies of our loved ones. I did a funeral just last week, and I've mentioned it here in Clifton, somebody I didn't know. And I noticed as they put the urn in the ground, they had placed it in a little wooden box. And family members came along to put things in the box. And one lady came by and put a dollar bill, rolled up with a little rubber band, stuck it in there, and said, he was always broke, but he won't be now. A little fishing lure, and a little tractor trailer, and a little matchbox car. They were giving things that they thought were special to a loved one. But you see, how different is the tomb of Jesus? And it is famous not for what it contains, but for what it doesn't contain. It's empty. And the angels spoke the best news the world ever received on that first 
what I call resurrection morning, that first resurrection day. He's not here. He's risen. Now, I know the other day I sent an email off to somebody, another pastor, and we were discussing different things, and he sent me an email back, and I said, have a blessed resurrection day. That old Swede I sat under for 18 years, Dr. Kahlberg, used to always say that. It's a blessed resurrection day. He didn't say happy Easter. And, you know, I shot off that to another pastor as I was saying, have a blessed resurrection day Sunday. And he sent me back, and you preach, he said, that I can't believe it happened, but it did, sermon. And that's what we're here for, the resurrection. That's why we're celebrating, it's the resurrection. And what does a resurrection, got my tongue around my eye tooth that time, what does the resurrection mean to you and me? It gives meaning to all the Christian life. For if Christ is not risen, then we will not be raised. And again, we're just wasting our time here this morning. In this difficult passage, Paul describes the, and, and, and declares what life would be without the resurrection. Baptism is meaningless. Sacrifices for the cause of Christ are meaningless. And even moral restraint is meaningless. I used to have a girl in Presque Isle used to say to me all the time. She said, you know, Pastor, there is no God. She said, you know, and we were, she never called me pastor. She called me John. We were really good friends. She was one of those chic chicks, you know, and she was into everything else. And I used to love, she had a bumper sticker that said simplify on her very, 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 very expensive SUV. <laughs> she didn't simplify very much. She, she, liked the, she liked the creature comforts we all did. She didn't simplify. And she had all the bells and whistles in her house. Her husband took very good care of her. He was a good friend of mine. But she said, you know, you don't have to, there's no moral restraints in the world. I said, okay, good. Tonight, I'm going to come to your house. I know you're going to be away, and I'm going to break in and take whatever I want to. You can't do that. Why not? It's against the law. So, it's okay with me. I don't care about the law of man. Well, you can't. Well, where do we get the laws from? Well, we, we get them. From where? Who makes right or wrong? God does. And when we don't understand that and see that, we just lose our moral comfort. And, and one of the things Paul's arguing here is everything's meaningless unless there's a resurrection. In fact, this means that the resurrection not only has eternal significance, but also practical application to our lives today. And these practical meanings of the resurrection can be seen in a series of questions that Paul asks us here. Without the resurrection, he says, our baptism is meaningless. Now, I don't know how many of you here, hopefully all of you have been baptized. But in verse 29, he, he, he kind of raises that up. And it's one of the most disputed passages in all the Bible. And there are more than 50 different interpretations of it. People sit down and their heads get so, you know how eggheads are. They get straining and all of a sudden the egg looks like it's going to start to crack. Some say it refers to baptism by proxy. That is, one person can be baptized for another. And people do that. The Mormons practice that. But some say it refers to being baptized because of someone else. For example, a loved one's death may cause another to repent and follow the Lord in baptism. The correct meaning is this. It symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When we get baptized, we go under the water as Christ was buried. And we rise again out of the water to the newness of life in Christ Jesus. In fact, Romans 6 says that. What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, Paul argues. He says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We go under the water and we come up out of it. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. My hope is that when I take this last breath, when I close my eyes for the last time, in this life, 
that I will open them again in his presence. The Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and I want to see him. I want to see him. That's my hope this morning. I want to see him. I've preached this, uh, 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 used this illustration a couple of times in the last few weeks. That day that Thomas came into the, was there with the rest of the disciples, and all of a sudden Jesus appeared. Remember, he wanted to put his finger in his hands. He says, guess what, Thomas? It's me. And he did. And he says, here's my side. And what did he say to him? He said, okay, now that's cool. Blessed are you because you've been able to put your finger in my hand and touch my side. And you believe, so you're blessed. But guess what Jesus said to him? Blessed are they who haven't seen me and believe. He was talking about you and I today. He was talking about us so many years later. We are blessed because we believe him. If there is no resurrection, then baptism is a meaningless ritual. Without the resurrection, our sacrifices are useless. My working for the church, my being a pastor, my going without sometimes, my doing all kinds of stuff, people slamming doors in my face, people getting upset because I'm preaching a gospel they don't want to hear. All the nonsense that I've gone through in my life was wasted. Paul said that in the 30, if I fought beast in Ephesus, he says, it means nothing because I, why did I do it? If there's no resurrection, if there's no afterlife, in fact, he went on to say here, didn't he? He said, if this is all there is, let's drink and be merry. Let's have a party now because there's nothing else. But that's not it. And I don't know about you, but I'm scared. Because I don't want to roll those dice. I don't want to take a chance. Because what's been offered to me makes sense. What's been given me in my faith sounds right. Because as much as people tell me there is no God out there, boys, I don't know where you can figure that one out. I listened to some people the other night. They've written a new book. They were on public TV, and they were talking about that. We are made up of stardust. Well, the same particles, the same molecules might be. They're the same type of atoms. But God took from nothing and made something. That's what Genesis tells us. So I might be made up of some stardust, but I was created because God wanted to have a relationship with people, and he, he created us for that reason. He wanted to talk to you. He wanted to spend time with you. He wanted to know you. And as different as you may be from me, he wants to know us personally. And the only way we can know him personally is by having a relationship with him. And if there was no Christ and there was no resurrection, then we're wasting our time, and let's not even talk to him. 